Welcome to 630 Naperville. I'm Nathan Ronchetti. And I'm Paige Ronchetti. Thanks for joining us. Today, we'll learn how to avoid and treat common summer ENT problems, ask an attorney your most pressing legal questions, tee off with Naperville Park District, and sit down with a local woman who makes art accessible and oh so fun. But first, we're off on location with Chief Aries and the Naperville Police Department. Hi everybody, I'm Jason Aries, Police Chief in Naperville. And I'm here to talk to you today about something I often get asked about in the community and why do we have a SWAT team? Well, first of all, our department's team is called the Special Response Team or SRT. And rather than go on and on about this topic that I'm super passionate about, having been a member of the team in the past, I'm gonna cover three things today with you and I brought some friends to help me out. I'm gonna cover why we have the team, who's on the team, and some of the specialized equipment that this team has that they use to protect you and themselves while working out in the field as a Naperville police officer. So let's talk about the why. SRT is like an insurance policy. It's something you hope you never have to use, but when it's there, you really need it. And what is that insurance policy for? It's for those serious police calls that we respond to barricaded subjects, hostage situations, very high risk search warrants. In addition to those, special events have become events that need even more security than they have in the past. And this team is activated for all the major special events in our town to add that extra level of security to those. So let's talk about now who's on that team. That team consists of 20 to 25 operators who are highly trained in a lot of different special tactics to respond to those situations we spoke about. It's a very, very difficult team to get on based on the physical fitness requirements, the psychological requirements, the tactical decision making that has to be displayed, as well as the need to be expert marksmen with all the different platforms that this team uses. Here to explain a few of those things and talk a little bit more in depth about the people on the team is Commander Bill Barrett, the team's assistant team commander. Let's walk over and talk to Bill now. All right, thanks, Chief. Who we have with us today is Alex Mumenthal and Vince Romandine. These are two of our SRT operators, but they got two distinct roles. Vince is our Thames medic and Alex is an SRT uh, operator. As you can see, they're both dressed in green, and we've chosen that color for a specific reason. It helps blend into the background. It's good for concealment at night, but it also gives us a professional and distinct look that's different than the uniformed police officer. Also, Chief, you notice that they both are wearing ballistic armor. It's including a helmet and a full coverage vest, and this provides advanced ballistic protection against small arms and rifle rounds. Yeah, thanks, Bill. And I think one of the things that you pointed out that I think is so important to point out to the community is this partnership we have with the FD and the fact that our paramedics are willing to join as TEMS members on the SWAT team and their willingness to go into these very dangerous scenarios with us to protect us and protect community members that may need treatment in there. These men and women on the team go in unarmed in situations where there's a high probability that firearms are involved with the call, yet go in there without any hesitation, again, to serve the team and serve the community. Thanks a lot for, for your willingness to do that for the team and for the community. Bill, now that we've talked about them and their equipment, let's move over to some of our equipment that we use on these call outs. All right, Bill, why don't you talk about what we have here right next to us today? All right, Chief, what we have here is a robot and a drone. And these are two pieces of technology that we've added to our team, and they provide us a great asset. What these two devices allow us to do is send them into a structure or into a site, and we can hold back and not send our people. And we can send the drone or the robot inside to gather intel and to locate and communicate with suspects. We can also use them to get kind of an overview of the entire crisis scene. And now we're gonna talk about the biggest thing that we have here today, and that's our armored rescue vehicle. And quite possibly the thing I get asked about the most when I'm out and about talking about the SWAT team. The armored vehicle, I could go on and on with hypotheticals of what we need it for, but I'm gonna use two examples, real life examples that our department has been involved in to really tie it together, the need for this vehicle. The first one is Henry Pratt, which was the incident in Aurora. Our special response team responded and assisted with that scenario. And the only way that we could get police personnel, all agencies involved, into that building because they were being shot at was through the use of armored vehicles 
providing the necessary ballistic protection to get that access. There's example one. Example two is a call that we had in our town a few years ago involving someone in crisis. This person was armed with a handgun and wanted to harm themselves. The way they wanted to carry that out was to exit their house, point their firearm at a police officer, and have us shoot them. This vehicle and the training that our special response team has afforded us the opportunity to create a plan and introduce a less lethal option should that individual have carried through with his plan to come out and force that confrontation. Without this, we would have never had that ability. And what it ended up with was a safe resolution for that individual in crisis that day. Those two things, I think, just sum up so well the necessity of this vehicle because those calls, while they're not in the hundreds, when they happen, you need this vehicle and this team to assist in those situations. All right, now that we've given you the situation, the reasons why we need the armored vehicle, Bill, why don't you talk about some of the things on the inside that make this armored rescue vehicle very unique? All right, Chief, yeah, this is considered an armored medevac, and it's got some unique features. One of them, it's outfitted with advanced medical equipment, including medication. It's got enhanced lighting inside so that our Thames medic can work on a, a victim in the back and actually transport them to the hospital on a higher level of care. Thanks again, Bill, for that explanation of the inside of the vehicle. And thank you to everyone that watched today and learned a little bit more about why we have a special response team and why we have an armored rescue vehicle to keep you are community safe. Thanks everyone, stay safe. Have you ever gone to a concert and experienced ringing in your ears? Or gotten swimmer's ear after taking a dip in the lake? There are so many ENT problems that can put a serious damper on our warm weather fun. Joining us today on 630 Naperville is Dr. Rodney Coniglia, an otolaryngologist with Edward Elmhurst Medical Group. He's here to offer some tips on avoiding and treating those pesky summertime ear, nose, and throat situations. Welcome, doctor. Thank you. So talk to me about the connection between our ears, nose, and throat and kind of how they all work together. Well, the ear, nose, and throat are all lined by similar tissue. I always tell people the ears are like small sinuses and the ears drain into the back of the sinuses, then the sinuses drain down into the throat. And so when it comes to taking care of ourselves, thinking about summer activities, we might be at, a, we might be at an outdoor concert, and so we want to stay away from those large speakers, right? Protect ourselves from that? Correct, because loud noises can damage the cochlea. The cochlea is the hearing mechanism in the inner ear, and it's very sensitive to loud noises. And so that can sometimes be that, that ringing, and so that's tinnitus or tinnitus? Yeah, you could say tinnitus or tinnitus. And tinnitus, I explain to people, is like pain. So if someone hits you in the knee with a hammer, you'd mm. experience pain. When an ear experiences tinnitus, it's telling you that it's been damaged. And so if that ringing is not going away, you know, when should we be alarmed? When should that cause some concern? Well, if you were go if you were to go to a loud concert and you had ringing for a day or two, maybe not a big deal. But ringing that persists, whether it's because of a loud noise or it started de novo for many days or weeks, then you should see a doctor. Excellent. And I, I know myself, I like to get into some water in the summertime and kind of cool off. And sometimes there's an issue with swimmer's ear. And so how common is that and how can I prevent that? Swimmer's ear is one of the most common things we see in the summertime. And it essentially is the heat and then the water that gets down into the ear and sometimes it gets trapped in there because someone has excess wax. So in order to prevent it, uh, one is keeping yourself from building up wax in your ear. Mm -hmm. And the number one reason why people build up wax in their ears is because they use Q-tips. Oh. So everyone thinks, oh, I'm gonna use a Q-tip and clean the wax out. And what you end up doing is getting the wax out of the external ear, but you end up pushing wax down in deeper. Okay. And then over time, that builds up down in there deeper, and then water gets in behind it. The other thing that Q-tips do can scratch your ear. Mm. So you get micro scratches in there, and those are great places for bacteria to dive under the skin and then cause an infection. So first is keeping Q-tips out of your ear. 
Next, uh, people who are prone to swimmer's ear then need to keep their ears drier. Uh, one way of doing that is making sure you dry your ears off when you get out of the water. Some people use a blow dryer when they get out of the shower. And the other thing is there's over-the-counter preparations called swimmer's ear. Um, so you can pick that up and when you're done swimming, you can put that in your ear to keep your ear dried out. So avoid the Q-tips, keep it dry, and you'll be set up for a summer of less pain? Yeah, most people do well then. Excellent. And so thinking about other preventative things and some symptoms you might see, so allergies are pretty relevant year round, but Correct. there's some seasonal allergies we see in summer and some symptoms. What do you typically see in the summer from allergies? So we start off with tree allergy, um, and that happens in the spring, and then uh, the next thing that happens is grass allergy, and that'll be in the spring into you know, early June. We get a little bit of a break in midsummer, and then we get hay fever or ragweed allergy. And in the middle of the heat. Right. Right, right. So right when we think we're doing well, then hay fever will start kind of late July, early August. So those are the different allergens that we have to worry about. The symptoms that people get uh, mostly are sneezing, congestion, itchy eyes. And if you know that you're prone to allergies, one of the keys that we'll tell people is start your allergy medicine before the season starts. Mm. So we talk about the pump getting primed. So once the pump is primed and you have the symptoms, it's harder to control them. But if you start your allergy medicine before the season starts, the pump never gets primed and sometimes you can cruise through the season pretty well. So prevent before it, it's in place. Correct. Excellent. And I think last thing we think about when we're planning our summers is summer travel. And mm -hmm. so a lot of times we're hopping onto a plane and you get that, that feeling, that plugged ear feeling. And so what's causing that? So that's called eustachian tube dysfunction. So we have a long, narrow tube that goes from our middle ear space down into the back of our nose. That tube is so narrow that the slightest amount of swelling in it gives us symptoms. And so people who are prone to it, when they get in an airplane, we're gonna have changes in pressure, which is gonna cause swelling of the mucosa or the lining of the tube and then give them symptoms. If it's bad enough, people will actually build up fluid behind their eardrum because a lot of people don't know the middle ear makes fluid just like our sinuses do, but you never notice it because it's such a small amount. However, if that tube gets plugged, then the fluid is stuck in there and then people end up getting hearing loss or then that fluid is a nice bath for bacteria to invade and cause an infection that will get an ear infection. So what's a safe way to unplug my ears if I'm in that situation on a plane? One is just plugging your nose and trying to pop your ears. Mm. I'll, I'll have patients come in all the time and they'll say, well, I thought that was dangerous. You know, I mean, if you were gonna do it I, so hard that you were gonna pass out, you know, maybe you shouldn't do it that hard, but most people aren't gonna do that. So trying to pop your ears just by plugging your nose is one way. Other people chew gum or swallow mm. liquids. The last thing you can do is preventative. There are things called ear planes. There are earplugs that you can put in before the airplane flight, and they actually help equalize the pressure in your ears. Very cool. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate your time and your tips to keep us healthy and safe this summer. Well, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. After the break, a lawyer tackles some of the most frequently asked legal questions, and the best part, you won't be billed for it. Stay with us. We were there when true crime podcasts spiked your anxiety. Maybe try binging something less intense next time. We were there for that. And we're here for everything else. Here it's personal because we get to know you. you ask if you had just one question 
Attorney James Bernicke is here to discuss some of the legal questions he's recently received in this very special Ask an Attorney installment of Legally Speaking. Hey, James, great to have you back. Hey, Paige, great to be back. Yeah. So let's dive right into these questions that you've received lately. So let's pretend that I'm starting an imaginary business <laughs> with my best friend. Do we need to get anything in writing? Yes. Yes, we've had so many clients contact us that have had the same situation. They started a new business with a longtime friend of theirs, and then something happens. Maybe the business isn't doing well. Maybe they want to bring on a new partner, and they don't have an agreement in place on how to proceed with this. And that's when it gets contentious and dicey, and sometimes they're not friends anymore. Whereas I have other clients who they say, me and my best friend are starting this new business. Let's get everything all laid out, and then they usually don't need an attorney down the road because they've already prepared for most of the situations that could happen. So it's always better to be proactive versus reactive because having someone set it up properly at the onset will save you money throughout the entire business so that you can have that money from the business to yourself and not pay an attorney to fix things for you. Right, save money, but also maybe save the friendship just in case things get dicey. Yes, yes, yes. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so along the same lines of this imaginary business that I just started, <laughs> let's say that I, I know I'll need occasional legal advice, but mm -hmm. I don't have the money to have somebody on retainer. What, what options are there for me? Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of people who um, call an attorney when they need them, but again, I always prefer being proactive. And we have a lot of clients who say, we're gonna pay you every month a, a much smaller amount than an in-house attorney to just keep everything going smoothly for us. Um, check out our employee handbook, uh, settle any disputes that we have with our employees or with vendors or anything like that, make sure our corporation is renewed properly, make sure, just make sure everything rolls along. People have insurance agents and um, you know all kinds of other things, accountants that they do a similar thing for. They don't have their own accountant, their own insurance guy in-house, but they pay someone every month just to kind of keep things moving along smoothly. And we really found that that is effective because people actually end up paying less because they avoid so many of the problems that come up that are costly. So by just mm -hmm. paying a little bit each month and keeping your, you know, an attorney kind of on retainer, you're able to avoid all these large legal problems and kind of nip them in the bud when they happen rather than having to go and litigate and spend quite a bit of money. <laughs> okay, I'm glad you brought up large <laughs> legal problems because my next question Let's say in my imaginary business, I have an unhappy customer mm -hmm. and I get served with a lawsuit or maybe you're served with a foreclosure or something. Mm -hmm. What do you do in that situation? Honestly, and this is hard for people, but you, you need to call and get help right away mm -hmm. because the worst thing you can do is wait on it. Because we've had people call us and say, I'm, I'm so far along in the process now that my wages are getting garnished or my, um, my house is going to sheriff sale on Thursday. What are my options? And it's very limited at that point. Whereas, again, be proactive. I think that's gonna be my new motto. If you contact somebody right away, there's options to negotiate the debt, to uh, avoid a foreclosure. Maybe you can sell your house. Maybe you can do a modification, things like that. But if you get served in, what month is this, July? If you get served in July, <laughs> Um, you have a lot of options. If you wait until February or March when you're at the end of it, you have a lot less options. Oh, goodness. Mm -hmm. Well, that is great to know. And it sounds like really, for most legal situations, time is of the essence and you don't want to drag your feet, true? 100%, yeah. Be, be proactive, have, have an attorney, make friends with an attorney and you know, talk to them before you start doing things because you can really save yourself a lot of heartache and money in the long run. For sure. <laughs> and um, you know, so we have been asking questions from actual people today. Mm -hmm. uh, would you like more of these questions? Absolutely, yes. We're gonna share this on social media and we're gonna put it on our website and we would love more questions from people who've been in these situations and want an attorney to kind of talk them through their particular questions. We, we love doing that because it, it helps other people know what to expect and maybe they can avoid some of these questions before they, they happen. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. <laughs> and if you have a pressing legal question, please reach out to the Bernicke Law Firm to ask an attorney. Up next,
we're off to the greens with the Naperville Park District to get you all teed up to improve your game if you're having a rough time on the course. Do you, you see what I did? Ah, oh, you drive me crazy. Roll the tape. Hi, I'm Samira Luthman with the Naperville Park District and welcome to Park It. Today, I'm at beautiful Naperbrook Golf Course, which is one of the district's two 18-hole golf courses, and I'm joined by head pro, Tim Dunn. Tim, thanks for joining us today. Morning, Sam, thanks for having me. So, we could stand here and you could give us all kinds of golf tips and tricks all day long, but I actually wanna focus on a little bit something different that I know is important to the game of golf, and that's etiquette. What exactly is etiquette, and why is it so important to the game of golf? So etiquette, yeah, let's dive into that term real quick. Uh, etiquette and golf go way more hand in hand, in my opinion, than more so any other sport. Okay. Uh, it's often referred to as a gentleman's game. Mm -hmm. um, and when you think about it, there's no other refs or umpires out there while the player is playing golf. Uh, it's gotta be the only sport that that occurs in. Um, the penalties that are called by the players are self-imposed, which is very unique in golf, mm -hmm. and very unique in sports, as a matter of fact. Um, in my opinion, there's three folds to etiquette in golf. It relates to the player's safety while they're out there. It relates to the quality of the golf course and its conditions, mm -hmm. more so leaving it in better shape than when you found it. And then it also re relates to the pace of play. Um, here at Naperbrook, we really stress and emphasize the three R's, which are replace, rake, and repair. Mm -hmm. That is replacing your divots in the fairways repairing your ball marks on the greens and it is raking the golf bunkers when you walk out of them. So it really sounds a lot like sportsmanship. Very much so, okay. um, very much so. And it's very important that we treat or teach our young junior players that because you can learn a lot of life lessons um, at a young age learning golf the proper way. Definitely. You mentioned pace of play. What exactly is that and how does it impact the game? Uh, pace of play is the million dollar question um, no matter what golf course you go to. Um, post COVID things have kind of lightened down a little bit with pace. Um, some of the protocols we had to put in play are still in place, which is kind of alleviate that issue. Naperbrook here, we have a time par system, letting them know how quick they need to play each hole um, to reach a certain nine hole time and then an 18 hole time. Um, it just kind of boils down to there's so many other activities for these players and families that they don't have five hours to be out here. Sure. Well, and it would impact their momentum of the game, too, and kind of how they're feeling and how they perform. Very much so. Uh, golf is a very mental game, very finicky game. And if you run into any speed bump or hiccup out there, um, it's going to throw off your, your mental side of it and then, uh, again, your momentum. Sure. That makes sense. So I've got kind of a strange question. I know that golfers yell four when a ball kind of goes awry and why is that? What, what's the history on that? Why do people yell that? So yeah, the history on that almost originated when the game was originated in Scotland. Uh -huh. um, that was just the term that they came up with. Um, it is a universal term. Everyone knows what it means, whether you're a golfer or not. Um, kind of what we stress here with our junior players is when you hear that word, don't turn back. Your natural instinct's gonna wanna look. Right. Duck. Yeah. <laughs> Cause you never know what, where that ball's gonna go. Right. It's just is not going where the player that hit it wants it to go. A term that I'm vaguely familiar with, I'm not a huge golfer, but is through lines. Can you talk a little bit about that, what that is and why it's important? Yeah, through lines, again, it's, it's an etiquette procedure on the putting surface. Okay. So if the player misses his or her original putt, it's the exact line that the putt is traveling past the hole. Um, when players are on the putting surface, they're trying not to walk through their playing partner's lines. Um, as a courtesy, as an as a etiquette thing. Okay. Uh, Jack Nichols had a great line where he said, I'm not even worried about my through lines. Uh, his mindset being if he was worried about that, then he's already talked himself into missing his original putt, which is a great, great swing thought. So one aspect that I am very familiar with, and I'm sure a lot of golfers or people who've played even one game of golf are familiar with, and that's a divot. So why is the the maintenance of the divots or the, the etiquette regarding divots so important? So basically that boils down to the rules of golf and playing the ball as it lies. So if you take a divot in the fairway and do not replace it, players behind you, by pure bad luck, if they end up in that divot, they must play it from that, that point. Oh, okay. um, there's a couple different ways to do that. You can just go back and pick up the turf and replace it. Mm -hmm. Or a lot of courses have sand seed mix on the carts that you can pour into there as well. Okay. So you're actually picking up the piece of turf and putting it back in. Bingo, okay. yeah, that's 100% correct. Got it, all right. 
Well, thanks for being here today, Tim. I know we barely scratched the surface with regard to etiquette, but it's a good start. Some of the, the major things we talked about. Yep, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And if you're interested in learning the game of golf or perfecting your game of golf, this is the guy to see at Naperbrook. Thanks very much for joining us today, and I'll see you next time on Park It. Liz Spencer sits down with the woman behind Naperville's upscale paint and sip studio after the break. Stay with us on 630 Naperville. Oh yeah, I'll take one of your specials, my man. There you go, princess. We were there when you explored questionable street meat. Maybe read the reviews next time? We were there for that. And we're here for everything else. Here it's personal, because we get to know you. Welcome back to 630 Naperville. Up next, Liz Spencer chats with Naperville business owner, Pam Bartlett. Thank you for joining me on Naperville Notables. My guest today is Pam Bartlett, the creative force behind Naperville's upscale paint and sip studio, Pinot's Palette. Welcome to the program, Pam. Thanks for having me, Liz. I just love Pinot's, we appreciate it. Um, Tell me a little bit about what's on your bucket list. So my three top bucket list items are, two of them involve travel, well, three of them involve travel. Excellent. Uh, the Netherlands, to see the Northern Lights. I've always wanted to see the Aurora Borealis. I hear you can see it from Alaska, but yes. I think I'd rather go to the Netherlands to see it. Both are, both are quite the adventure. Yeah, yeah. The second one is a a river cruise through Europe. Mm -hmm. I've always wanted to do that. I've been on a couple cruises on the ocean, but mm -hmm. I think I'd like to try it where you're on a river and you can see something and scenery from both sides and all day long. So I think I want to try that. I hear that uh, if you go on the Rhine River that it's a very smooth sailing experience, unlike the ocean, which can give you a little trouble and I, I don't do well with boats. So people are like, try the, try the river version of it. So Maybe we should do it together. Maybe we yeah. can, hey, we'd be, <laughs> we'd be fun. I don't know if they're ready for us. That's right, that's right, it'd be fun. Yeah, the Rhine River, that's a good one. Yeah. yeah. And the third thing is on my bucket list is hopefully one day to have a home in Colorado. I love the mountains. And, and you love the mountains. Is anything else about Colorado? Are you from Colorado? I am from Colorado. Okay. And my family is in Colorado. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. What part of Colorado? Uh, they're all in Colorado Springs. Okay. And then I have a sister that lives in Pennsylvania. But there's a, a lot of great places in Colorado. And I've been out there actually just about a month ago. My sister and a friend and I were driving around different towns in Colorado just checking it out. And I crossed a lot off so <laughs> my sister goes we need to go west so next time we'll go west and and look for little towns that's awesome most people you know want to buy a home in florida or arizona and you're like nope going to colorado colorado i love that so another interesting thing that comes to mind that we were talking about is that you have a favorite recipe but i didn't i guess i didn't know you were such the cook i'm gonna have to come over more and not just drink wine with you yeah <laughs> i do have a favorite recipe and uh it is Jamie Oliver's uh, Perfect Roast Chicken. Okay. It's got a lot of great ingredients in it. Uh, prosciutto, lemon, thyme, butter. You let the butter get soft and you put all of those ingredients in the butter and then you have to stuff it under the skin before you roast it and it's delicious. And I actually used that recipe uh, when I did the video for MasterChef. Me and a girlfriend tried out for MasterChef a couple years ago when they were downtown Naperville and we made it to the part where we could do a video of us at home cooking, and that's the dish I made. And then we also made it to go to downtown Chicago to talk about the show, but the farmer that owned the pig farm, he, he beat us all out. He, and beat, got to go, yeah. Beat out the suburban nights with the, you know, the farmer got beat out. Yeah. There. Well, that's so cool. I mean, most of us wouldn't, you know, a, may not be able to cook that level, but may not be, want to go on to MasterChef. What was the motivation to kind of try it out? It just seemed like fun. Cooking, I love to cook. I'm sure there would have been some wine involved too. So 
just, it's competitive, and I'm competitive, so I'm like cooking, uh, that's competitive, I'll do that, yeah. That's awesome. I'm, I'm not that good of a cook, and I don't think I would want to cook with the pressure of everything under everybody watching me, so. True. True. That, True. that ups the, the game a little bit there. Yeah. Well, that's excellent. So, with your love of travel, um, the question that comes to mind, if you couldn't live in the United States, where might you want to, to live? Well, the next best thing to Colorado <laughs> is Switzerland. Wow. The Alps. Yeah. Uh, I, I've been there. I love it. They've got great mountains, great lakes. Um, it's safe there. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's just a real vibrant uh, place. And it's also neutral. It's not only neutral, as they always say, but it's in the middle of Europe, so you can get anywhere from there. It's a, it's a good place to be if you want to go to Italy, you want to go to Paris. So it's right in the middle of everything. That's excellent. And it's clean. It's clean, right. Yeah. So are you a skier at all? I am a skier. skier. Yeah, yeah, it's that Colorado background. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. excellent. So I, I'm not surprised by any of this because you have such a, a creative energy about you, and that's what you. I think drives so much with uh, Pino's palette. Thank you. Thank you. How long, what, how long have you been with Pino's now or owning so, it? So uh, December, it will be open 10 years. Wow. So I've been with them already for 10 years, but the studio opened in uh, December of 2013. Oh, wow. So, so you're coming up on a big anniversary. Big anniversary, and yeah, it's a lot of fun and looking forward to quite a few more years there. That's awesome. Well, you do a great job. You're such a community leader. You're always willing to pitch in creative energy, good ideas. So thank you so much for all that you do for Naperville. We really appreciate it. You're welcome, Liz. I, I love it, and I love it here. It's a great town. And thanks for joining me on Naperville Notables. Thanks for joining us here on NCTV 17. And now you know, from, from 630 Naperville. Naperville. I'm Nathan Ronchetti. And I'm Paige Ronchetti. See you next time.